Hi, everybody. Welcome to Gay V Club. I'm Mariana Salem, aka Mary. I'm here with my co host, Jury. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, How could you make fun of my Arabic name like that? <laughs> because I'm allowed to. This is so... This, I'm, no, you're not. I, I'm allowed to. I'm an Arab. No, I should explain <laughs> to our beloved listeners that, you know, we have a little note for our intro and Duryadin has keyboard smashed their own name, which is pretty iconic. But anyway, I am here with Duryadin, my co-host, Duryadin Hark, also known as Daya. We're two writers who love movies, television and books, especially when they're gay. And we're here to talk about how we relate to these texts as gay people of color. It's been a while. It's been such a while. Hello, everyone. Hello, guys. Hi. Missed you. We missed you. We missed missed you. doing this. Yes. Thank you for being patient with us. We are on Twitter and Instagram at gayv underscore club. And if you want to support us even more than just listening, you can also join our Patreon which is patreon.com slash gayvclub, where we have lots of bonus episodes there for you to listen to. Yeah. So today we are finally going to talk about Barry Jenkins' 2016 masterpiece, Moonlight, based on the unproduced play in Moonlight, Black Boys Look Blue by Terrell Alvin McCraney. And it's, it's, it's the best, it's the best, it's one of the best films of all time. It is a masterpiece. It's very difficult for me to name a movie that is better. I think because it's also such a unique film too. Like you can't Mm. even list movies that are like it. Yeah. Because it's so unique. It's just beautiful. I feel like everything that I say about this film is just going to sound like really corny like or overused. Like I'm going to be like stunning, masterpiece. But it it really is those things Mm. though. Like Mm. like we overuse Mm. those words, but it is 100% true when discussing Moonlight. Yeah, so Moonlight follows Chiron, a gay black boy from Miami, through three stages of his life, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. It's the first gay film to win the Academy Award for Best Picture, so along with the film itself, we're also going to talk about its win and just the general history of LGBT cinema at the Oscars. So one of the most key concepts obviously explored in this film is toxic masculinity and the specific expectations placed on black men in their community. We're not really in a position to discuss that, of course, um, but there is already a lot of analysis by black people that is available to read, so we highly recommend checking that out. Just in preparing for this episode, I read a couple of pieces that were written by um, black film critics and academics. I read quite a few, but two I want to um, recommend. Uh, One is called Am I a Faggot? by L.H. Stallings, and it looks at the representation of black queerness in film and where Moonlight sits in that, and looks at how the film deals with masculinity, but also kind of neglects femininity in a way. It was a very interesting read. And the other piece I want to recommend is by Ronaldo Walcott called Moonlight's Necessary Company, and it sort of contextualizes Moonlight in the tradition of um, black cinema like within the gang film tradition and stuff like that. Very great pieces by black queer academics. And I'll put them in the little notes, the little blurb underneath the podcast if anyone wants to check them out because they're. Yeah. I think it's important to listen to black LGBT voices when it's a film about a black queer experience that we're talking about. Those are just two of the texts that are available. Yeah. You should obviously check out more. Barry Jenkins and the rest of the cast have also weighed in on this in a lot of interviews, behind the scene features and commentaries. So definitely have a listen to what they have to say as well. Yeah. As I said, Moonlight is one of the greatest films ever made. This movie, like, unlocks the film nerd in me release the beast like actually like in preparation for this episode i literally watched it twice in one night because i watched it nearly all the way through up until the diner scene and then i realized oh wait i like i was just watching it through netflix and then i realized like i do have a blu-ray and on that blu-ray is barry jenkins commentary which i hadn't watched with yet so i turned it off and like put on my blu-ray so that i could watch the movie again with the commentary Was there any particular little things from the commentary that were really nice? Yeah, I'm going to mention them as we go along. All right, cool. We first saw this in January 2017 on Invasion Day. Mm Mm-hmm. We had to pay like $40. Like, it sounds a bit, like, prissy to say this, but it it really is true. We we had to see this in gold class cinemas because that was the only... The only way to see Moonlight before it won Best Picture in Sydney 
was like paying like literally forty dollars per ticket. We're not saying that to be like oh, we had to suffer through like you know moonlight, you know eating friggin' chocolate sundae or whatever. No, no, no. To make the point that this movie it was hard for people to see. Yeah. Like, it was made very difficult to see for obvious reasons that we will discuss uh-huh. later. But I do want to start off and say, like, I am, you know, the number one Christopher Nolan anti. So whenever he or any of those other kind of filmmakers in that vein talk about how, like, it's so important to, you know, only watch their movies in the cinema. I am a big believer in just watching movies on your laptop, on your iPod Nano, on your Game Boy. like whichever, On your Game like, Boy Advance. If a movie is good, it doesn't matter what kind of screen you're watching it on. But this movie was so perfect for the cinema, like, of movies that I think... You should see, or at least like you should be able to see this in a like really nice dark room. You just need to be immersed. It is a very immersive movie anyway, so like it doesn't matter. Like I was just watching it on my TV twice in one night and that's fine. But this movie was so excellent to see in a cinema. The main reason of which is that uh, it's it's a very, it's cinematic. (laughs) It is. It's pure cinema. It is pure cinema. This is obviously an incredibly well-written, well-acted story, but just visually, this movie, like, there's a reason that this is a movie. This movie is the reason cinema was invented. <laughs> cinema was pioneered so that this movie could be made, because this is this is the peak, sorry. But the point I was making is, like, something key about this film is that the main character, Chiron, is the camera. The way that the camera moves throughout the whole film is representative of how Chiron's feeling or how Chiron relates to the character that he's in the scene in. So the movie, it goes through the three stages of Chiron's life and each chapter is titled with the name he goes by. So part one, uh, Chiron's childhood is called Little because that's the name that the kids in his community have given him. Even as a child, the expectations of masculinity that are placed on Chiron are too much for him. I mean, really, they're too much for anyone. But yeah, because he doesn't meet those standards, he's called Little. They call him that. Yeah, I guess that kind of shows already how Chiron has been isolated. They almost already know this about him, that they already know that he's gay before he does. Well, they do. He's just such a lonely kid. There's that scene between Juan and Paula, you know, when he confronts her and she says, like, are you going to tell him, like, why all the kids bully him? Like, are you going to be the one? Like, she, she, even she's aware of it. Mm. And she also, like, connects it directly to why he's picked on little Chiron. Like, he doesn't know yet. But he senses that he's different. I th- yeah, you have the opening shot, which is one, like, Marshall Ali's character. And it's this really smooth, wonderful single-take intro. And it's just circling around him and it establishes Juan's character. He has like a great control over his space, I guess, and it's just like very calm. He's very much the center of the world. Yeah, he is the he is the middle of the world. Yes. Mm. And then Chiron runs past him and is chased by bullies and we're pulled out of that world and it's like suddenly like this shaky handheld camera and this really harsh sound and it's just like a sensory overload watching this. Like you feel like you're being Locked in. Yeah, like, it really hits you. It's just a very sensory film and you're able to feel these things from his point of view through the camera alone. There's not a huge amount of dialogue in this movie and there's no narration at all, depending on the way that camera moves. You can see the way that Chiron is watching people or the way that he connects with people. And then, of course, one of the most important things about this movie is the color blue. Daya, did you know that in Moonlight, black boys look blue? <gasps> what? They do. That's so beautiful. It's such a beautiful piece of imagery, isn't it? Blue is the most human color, and it's so significant to Chiron in the story. It's like in in Moonlight, in the blue, that's where Chiron, he feels loved, and he feels safe, and he feels free to be himself. Throughout the movie, you can actually see him move into blue spaces when he's comfortable. Yeah. There's, of course, the iconic middle of the world, the quote-unquote baptism in the water. Do you know water is blue? Right. We're, we're literally swimming in blue. <laughs> we're swimming in blue because Sharon is the camera. Like, the camera is in the water with him, and there's, like, waves washing over him. We're being baptized with him and, like, over us, like... And as he learns to float, the camera steadies. And once he knows how to swim, it's really, it's really beautiful. I love this. What if no one I... got me, I know Nicholas Bertel got me. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Him and Barry Jenkins, like, this match made in heaven, honestly. Mm. I actually didn't notice this while watching the movie, but in the commentary, Barry Jenkins pointed out that there was actually a storm 
that was coming. They had like maybe 90 minutes to shoot this scene. They had to get it done real quick because there was this storm coming in. So it's like at the point where Driver and like knows how to swim, like, and he's he's let out. It's like he's being set out like into a storm. Wow. And that wasn't intentional. That was just the weather on the day. That was just the weather on the day. Did you know the final shot where he's looking out on the water and it's all blue? Like, yeah. that was not color corrected or anything. Like, what? that's just what it looks like. The final shot with all the blue is apparently just as is. That's what the light was that day. See, that feels to me like the Earth itself wanted Barry Jenkins to make this film. Mm. The very patterns of nature wanted this film to happen. And not just to happen, but to be one of the most beautiful films ever made. Cinema was invented so this film could be made. (laughs) The earth was invented. And then nature itself conspired. Humanity. Yes. And on the seventh day, God was like, I have done it. I've created the perfect conditions for Moonlight 2016, directed by Barry Jenkins. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, he, and his apartment is blue. Yeah, it's his house um, in, in part three. Like, his kitchen is all in the blue light. I do have a passion for colour in film. For ages, my ideal film, like career in film, was a colorist. I wanted to color films. And this was partly because I would, even as a kid, be frustrated when colors were dull in films. I don't know. Sometimes I think I'm a masochist because I'm also like a Marvel movie person. (laughs) And those films have the worst color. All Marvel fans are masochists. Yeah, they are. But like those films have the worst color grading. But anyway. I mean, I feel like a lot of the time with cinematography and especially with like how color grading works, there's certain colors that are always used in film, you know, like, oh, this scene, someone's very angry. So there's going to be like an orange or a red overtone or whatever. And something that's really beautiful about Moonlight, like, is the use of blue Mm. to mean love and to mean homeliness and to mean comfort. We don't often see blue used like that. I it's like lot- actually a warm color in this movie. Yeah. Blue I is a warm I say it, but it really is the warmest <laughs> yeah. color in this movie. Yes, it is. One thing I love about Moonlight is this use of blue in a way that we don't we don't see it used that often. Like yeah. usually blue is just environmentally there or it's used to be like the protagonist is sad or this place is cold or death or d- death <laughs> yeah. or like you know uh, you're on the we're foggy in the mortuary we're on the foggy moors and someone's about to get murdered by a ghost you know like the point of all that is to say that it's very rarely used to be a comforting color i just love that very intentional almost a version of that use of blue yeah i mean obviously like color is important in creating symbols which is why you know certain movies will always you know return to colors but it's also like moonlight makes the color blue like unique to itself and it makes it its own symbol Mm. within the movie instead of relying on like what blue is already meant to symbolize and uh speaking of the color blue when shiro meets kevin the love of his life for the first time he is wearing blue (gasps) Like, they're just kids, and they're playing this game in, like, a field, like, with a bunch of other boys called Tackle Ball. I only realized this, like, while watching with commentary, I thought that they were just playing soccer with, some, with like, there's just this ball that they'd made out of paper, you know? I thought that they were just playing soccer or something like that, something like, you know, rugby or something. Yeah. Um, but it's this specific game actually called Tackle Ball. Something we forgot to mention at the beginning, but this movie is a very personal film to Barry Jenkins and Terrell Alvin McCraney. It's semi-autobiographical and it's comprised of various moments from each of their lives combined. Like a lot of the stuff between Sharon and his mom is based on Barry Jenkins' experiences. But uh, yeah, so the tackle ball game, this is something that Barry Jenkins just borrowed from his youth. So it's a game where whoever has the ball gets tackled, basically. Hence the name. Yeah, hence the name, <laughs> which is why, you know, they're, they're trying to kick it away from each other towards other people. In the commentary, Barry Jenkins was talking about how someone else on the set asked, like, oh, what's this game you're playing? He's like, it's called Tackle Ball. And then this person that he was speaking with was like, where I grew up, this game was called Smear the Queer. Oh, my God. I, like, gossed at this because actually yeah. in this scene, that's why the kids, they're kind of all together and they're just, like, edging the ball towards Chiron as he's backing away because 
wrong. They want to tackle him. And so what Kevin does, as they're edging towards Sharon, Kevin grabs the ball and runs away so that they go after him instead. <gasps> He's actually rescuing him he in that is. first interaction. Oh, wow. That's love, bro. I know. I know. <laughs> and that's, like, so pure because they're kids. Part one is really pure. Like, it's just, like, as it should be when, when you're a child. Like, it's it's just really pure and wonderful. It's so gentle. The scene where they meet, we're introduced to, like, how gentle Chiron is. Like, not just in the, like, obviously, like, it's what other people perceive as a weakness in him. But, like, up until now, like, we know he's shy and that he doesn't like to touch other people. But he, you know, he reaches for Kevin's face yes. because he's bleeding and he's concerned for him. It's also the most, I think, the most we ever hear him talk. Mm in the movie in general is when he's with Kevin. Yeah. He doesn't even talk to, um, like, even though he trusts Juan. We see Sharon, like, open up just, like, as a kid mm. or, like, as the person that he is at that period of time the most when he's with Kevin. Kevin is just, like, generally just, he's just a very wonderful, kind person throughout this whole movie. He rescues him in the beginning. Even, like, as their kids in the scene directly after where they, like, have that scuffle and are fighting, it's like he's trying to encourage Chiron to act tougher. He's still trying to save him. Yeah, in a way that will stop kids from bullying him. You obviously see the way that masculinity is presented through Chiron, but, like, with Kevin as well, there's a lot to notice there. Kevin is important, like, in representing a bisexual experience as well. And you can see from the way that he interacts with Chiron, he's different from the other boys as well, mm -hmm. even though he's learnt to behave differently so that he's not mm. targeted. The fact that he sees Chiron and isn't derogatory to him in the same way that all the other boys are speaks to the solidarity that he has with Chiron. Because Kevin is also hiding a part of himself, so everything masculine, it is performative. It's almost like it's something that he did just the one time to have the reputation and then and then never again yeah which is why you know like in part two when the bully is like is like yeah you don't you don't do that stuff anymore do you yeah which ends up like goading him into the awful <sighs> knockdown stay down scene mm. uh which i don't want to get to yet okay well you don't have to i want to talk about the beach scene which is romantic as fuck all right then talk about that barry jenkins just he is one of the greatest romance directors ever. You know, like, the opening shot of If Beale Street Could Talk, it's just, like, the romance is oozing out. Like, it makes you want to be in love. His movies make you want to be in love. They do. They really do. And not in a sad way, you know? I don't know how to say this without kind of sounding sad, but, like, as someone who has, like, never really been in love, like, not, not really... Like, I mean, I say I'm in love with Ben Barnes, but, like, that's not really true because he's not in love with me yet. But, like, his films make me, like, feel like I get an idea of it kind of you thing. You feel held when you yeah. watch his movies. Like, I, well, I see his movies and I'm like, oh, like, I can understand what this must feel like. Like, he makes me understand it because oh, okay. I've never, like, I've, I don't think I've ever experienced it. And, but I, like, watch the movies and I'm like, I see that. I see mm. that. That's nice. That's yeah. what everyone's talking about. Mr. Kind of Jenkins thing. is, you know, actually really problematic for like setting unfair standards on what romance should feel like. So, like, if uh, yeah, you don't... he he is actually <laughs> just because if he's in just because he's in love. Just because he and Lulu Wang are just like the most power couple mm. ever. Like that doesn't mm. mean he has to push his agenda like on everybody. Barry Jenkins is like if your life isn't lit by James Laxton and scored by Nicholas Patel, <laughs> like it's Are you is are that you really in, love? Are you yeah. actually like Are you actually in love? Like beach scene, you know, obviously below the moonlight and actually just the beach is also very important, like the beach and the water and just the sound of the waves as well is key throughout this movie mm. with most of Chiron's conversations with people who he's not close with their faces are never seen in the same frame but like Kevin is beside him the whole time Jerrell Jerome and Ashton Sanders are so good in they, this movie <sighs> they were they, they were snubbed so they bad magic. I am just uh, magic I say what do I why say the, why the fuck does Timmy Chalamet I don't know have why an Oscar he has nomination? a career why does he have a career that's what I want to know. <laughs> Name me one thing that he d does that Ashton couldn't do and do better. 
Name me one thing. But yeah, also just Moonlight is quite a serious movie, but Gerald Jerome gives like such a good energy to it, the lightness to it that is very much needed. He is. You know, like when you first see him in part two and he's talking about how he got detention and it's... (laughs) Yeah, I know. (laughs) It is the funniest shit ever. (laughs) I almost feel like that was ad-libbed because like it's so funny. I know. Again, as we said, Kevin is one of those people that's like actually able to make Chiron open up and it's so sweet when they're on the beach. He just he just has like such a romantic soul and he's just like, damn, like shit just it just makes me want to cry sometime. Chiron is just like <gasps> You, you cry too? Because, you know, obviously, like, no one is ever vulnerable around Chiron. No one ever lets Chiron feel like it's okay to be vulnerable because they never do that. Yeah, and then Chiron's like, you cry too? Or oh, he's like, oh, you cry? <laughs> That's the thing that you do? <laughs> you do that? I thought that was only oh, in movies. I know. I thought that was just me. You know, like, even, even Kevin hits back. He's just like, nah. I, I feel like it, though. And then he's really not. He's like, what do you cry about? Like, he just, he just asks him, like, kindly. You know, one of my favorite lines in the whole movie is like, I cry so much that sometimes I feel like I'm going to turn into drops. Mm. You know, I want to do a lot of things that don't make sense. What a mood. Ah! Ah! You're like, so true, <gasps> bestie. I know. Also, okay, so after Sharon's first kiss, so you know, like when he thanks him for the ride home and just for hanging out. And, you know, mm. they, they touch hands and it is like the shot, of course, like of the whole film. It's not even a blue shot. It, like, it, it's no, in the yellow but light, but their hands, shot. it is a shot. The thing about that shot Tell me. that I learned from the commentary, it's actually like at a way higher frame rate than all the other shots in the movies. Oh. That's why it's like that, because it's like, oh. I don't know, like twice the amount of frames, like around 50 frames Why did it second. have to be so much higher? I don't know. They just wanted the vibe of it. Oh. That's why that shot hits so much. Like, you don't really notice it, but yeah. Barry Jenkins gets it. Like, he knows if you are going to tell a gay story, the hands are important. I mean, there's lots of hands shots in If Bill Street Could Talk, so I don't he, know. He just he, he has just, studied That's just another cinema. the reason. That's just another another of the ways that he that he understands romance, because he knows that the hands are the most important visually. Immanuel Kant once said that the hands are the most visible part of the soul, and he was right Mm. speaking of hands so this is just a wonderful scene obviously chiron feels held in this moment and we as the audience feel held which is why the next sequence is very jarring Mm. because this is when the bully that's been targeting chiron tries to get kevin on hand to do it and kevin kind of doesn't really have a choice in involving that so as i was saying about kevin and chiron like being in the same shot having you know such a focus on their hands and like even like the frame rate is higher what happens next in the next scene like it's just the complete opposite of that in that scene chiron is wearing a shirt that's like blue with white stripes and kevin is wearing a shirt that's white with blue stripes or it's the other way around or something anyway they're inverted basically at this point and Kevin has been pressured to beat up Chiron, basically. The thing about this scene is now they are never shown in the same frame. They're always across each other. Kevin is staring into the camera at us, like where Chiron and Chiron is staring out into Kevin. They don't share the same shot. And when Kevin hits him, you don't actually see his hand or anything like that throughout the whole thing. Like you just see, you see him like pushing him away and pushing him further, but like no hands are seen. I never it's noticed the opposite that. of romance, the opposite of intimacy. Like that's like, there's so much detail in just every aspect of the way that this film is made and, like, the way that everything is communicated throughout this movie that just, it kills me. Like, obviously, like, there's so many films, like, where this much thought is placed in, but I love this movie a lot for being one of those. Part 2 is definitely my favourite, obviously. I guess because it's the time period of life that I most relate to as Mm. a a young person. Also, I guess because it's probably, like, the most vocal that Chiron ever is. Mm. You know, I don't know where this quote is from, but it is quoted to Barry Jenkins. But like, you know, there's so many shots because Mr. Barry Jenkins makes everyone look beautiful. Like he loves showing people's faces and just showing how beautiful they are. I'll read the quote to you. We weren't necessarily trying to find actors who looked alike or had the same build. We were looking for actors who had the same feeling. The eyes are the window to the soul. So Mm. I thought... If I could find actors with the same eyes, the audience would connect with Chiron's soul. Oh. I just think that that is, like, he did that. Yeah. I never thought at any point, like, oh, it is 
unrealistic that Chiron could grow into black because the way that they are filmed is in like such a distinctive way that you know they're the same person. I also think like this ironically is where we see Chiron like we see so many shots of him by himself. You know, there's scenes of him on the is it a bus or a train? <gasps> oh yeah. Mm. Oh something to note about this film. Well, I mean, you could watch this film without being aware of it or whatever. But Barry Jenkins is spoken a lot about how much he's been influenced by this other filmmaker. His name is Wong Kar Wai. Wong Kar Wai is like the antithesis of Barry Jenkins in a way, in that he is all about like that kind of doomed romance, actually. Oh, no wonder he's one of your favorite filmmakers. Shut up. A lot of Barry Jenkins films, Moonlight especially, draws a lot of visual inspiration from Wong Kar Wai's films. And in Moonlight especially, there's a lot of visual similarities between uh, In the Mood for Love and, most importantly, Happy Together, which is a gay film that Wong Kar Wai made with Tony Leung and Leslie Chung. Happy Together is a very unique film about gay loneliness. So throughout part two especially, actually just, yeah, just so throughout Moonlight itself, there are a lot of direct parallel shots, I'd say, between them, between Happy Together and this film. In the with the tech ball scene and like the way that they're playing soccer is one of them. Chiron alone on the subway. Oh, I don't know if it's a subway. Just when Chiron's on the train, um, it looks really similar to the final scene in Happy Together. When Chiron and Kevin are driving in the car in part three as well, there's a lot of callback to that. Hmm. If you want to watch a gay movie that gives you the exact opposite energy <laughs> of Moonlight, um, in a way that if you want to watch a like. If you want to watch, if you feel like dying, <laughs> you feel like dying. <laughs> Happy Together is such a yellow film as well. It's like away from the blue. Yeah. So yeah, there are a lot of visual similarities between Moonlight and Happy Together, which Barry Jenkins has acknowledged as well. Like I know a lot of people around the time were posting side by side shot comparisons on Twitter, and Barry Jenkins was replying like, "Yes," and like he has talked about it. Um, nice. I think there's there's actually like a like a little interview he did with Criterion about Aww. just how much he loves Wong Kar Wai's films. I'll say just, if you are like a film nerd, I do actually recommend listening to the commentary of Moonlight with Barry Jenkins because he, as a film student, he loved listening to director's commentaries. And so like throughout the whole commentary, like just like I'm trying to include like everything, like information about everything that I really wanted to hear about when I was um, listening to other people's commentaries. And like, yeah, he, he hit the nail. Aw, thanks, Mr. Jenkins. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of visual similarities with Moonlight and Happy Together throughout the movie, but the actual diner scene itself in part three, there's a lot more comparisons with In the Mood for Love. So let's talk, Mary, start talking about food. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just start talking about food. <laughs> just start, all right, all right, all right, if you insist. Yeah, so um, as someone who generally loves food and, you know, grew up in an ethnic household, I love when films reflect the 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 idea of like food as love, you know? Food as home, like food as community. And I mean this isn't just in part 3 of Moonlight, like this is throughout the film. Like when Little first meets Juan, you know, he takes him Juan takes him for food. And then when he stays with Juan and Janelle Monet, you know, it's always scenes where they're, like, gathered around a table eating. Like, the very first, like, conversation he has in the film that addresses his sexuality, like, when he's asking one about being gay, it is over food. It is with food. And I love the way that food is present in this film as something that is comforting, as something that is representative of caring you know, it's like what you were saying about being held, like the food is about that too. And when you get to part three and Chiron has driven across the country. Part three is called Black. Black is a nickname that Kevin gave to Chiron around part two or around that time. It's like a name that he's sort oh. of annoyed by as well. He's like, why do you keep calling me that <laughs> throughout part two? But like, oh. it's actually I think it's cool, like, when Chiron is like building himself into a different person and like, just basically restarting his life over, he chooses the name that Kevin gave him. Wow. Wow. Man. I know. I know. Goodness me. So at this point, Chiron, he's moved away 
from Miami and he's living in Atlanta, Georgia. And he receives a call from Kevin and Kevin says, you know, next time I see you, like I'll, I'll cook for you. Mm. And so Chiron gay that he, the, this gay who can drive, <gasps> um, he drives. I looked this up. It's like a 10 hour drive Gee whiz. from Atlanta to Miami. He drives for 10 hours to be fed. Yes. To be fed and to be held. To be held by food. Yeah. Food is often used this way, you know. Instead of saying to someone, like, are you okay? You make them food. Especially in communities of colour, food is like a way of showing love and saying the things that people of colour are often too repressed to say. And I like the way that this film has that in a very subtle way in the way that food is present in Chiron's life and, and given to him when people don't know what to say. Mm. The fact that he feels safe with Juan and Janelle Monet is because they give him food, you know? Mm. Like, he doesn't say anything, but he knows that they're safe because they give him food and they give him, like, a warm place to stay, and that's really lovely. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, I just love the way that food is in this movie. I mean, I guess there's movies like Always Be My Maybe that more specifically like explore this theme of food as home, like food as comfort. A love language. As a love language. But I do think it is like very subtly present here. And also, like you say, love language, it's there in, in all the different kinds of love too. Mm. And I, I'm realizing as I'm saying this, we never see Chiron eat. With his mom. At his mom's house yeah. or with his mom. I love Andre Holland so much. <laughs> watch mm. The Nick. Everyone watch The Nick. In 2021, you're telling me. In 2021. To watch the Nick. Yeah. You love your boy Clive Owen. Like, I do watch love the my Nick. man Clive watch Owen. Watch The Nick. And also, like, Trevant Rhodes is so wonderful in this movie. I hate, like, whenever Trevant Rhodes has a new movie out and everyone's talking about how hot he is and they're like, oh my god, I've just discovered this extremely handsome man named Trevant oh, Rhodes. No. It's like, when it's because you in, didn't um, watch Moonlight. It's because you didn't watch Moonlight. <laughs> yeah, I love I love Trevant Rhodes and, and Andre Holland. They're just, they're just beautiful men. And yes. um, which, which is, you know, highest compliment from a lesbian. <laughs> yeah, so Andre Holland as Kevin cooks him, sorry for the pronunciation, arroz con pollo, you know, like rice, chicken, beans, and it's it looks so yummy. Intimate it scene. Is a, yeah, it is a very, like, loving and intimate scene because, you know, again, you have all the, like, close-up shots of hands and also blue in the, ki- blue in the kitchen, sorry. Blue in the kitchen. Like, Black's apartment in Atlanta, everything else is, like, all yellow and stuff, but, like, the kitchen itself is blue when you turn the lights on. And the kitchen that Kevin works in is bathed in this blue light. Like, when Chiron first gets that call from Kevin in the middle of the night, like, he he is, like, just washed with blue light over and over. So, again, that's the thing of, like, blue being a romantic color and also, like, in connection with food in the kitchen. It means he's home. Yeah. He is home. He's fed. He's held. Yes. And there is not a single thing in the scene that is not indicating that. They stay there talking until... They have to close up, I believe. They stay quite late. Like, they finish a bottle of wine and stuff. Yes. Andre Holland's audition tape for this movie is something that he sent in him speaking to the camera. Like, he's speaking to Chiron, like, showing him the photo of his son from his wallet. Apparently wasn't in the original script. But when Barry Jenkins and Terrell Alba McCraney, like, saw this tape, they, like, included in the film. Kevin just, like, opening up his wallet and showing him, like, his life and his family. And he's, like, he's, like, being open to him and showing him, like... Like, again, like on the beach, like, you know, being open and allowing him to share, like, he's doing this. He's like, I'm sharing, like, my life and my family with you, and this is how you can... It's his way of telling him, like, you can do this with me, too. You can share with me. Yeah, so Sharon does follow... Well, he he gives Kevin a lift home. The restaurant that Kevin works at is close to the ocean. Yes. As they're, like, just heading home, there's this also just this nice moment where Sharon, he looks out at the ocean, and it's... It doesn't look, like, dissimilar to the walkway that like towards the beach from part two i think maybe it's the same beach from part one. i don't know i don't know but yeah he he looks out at the ocean it's meant to evoke the beach from part it two. is meant to evoke yeah thank you mm-hmm. thank you english teacher you're welcome and kevin's home is close by the beach so like throughout that whole final scene you can hear the waves just in the distance as well they are surrounded by blue and not just any kind of blue either can i point out it's all like natural blue you know, mm. like like it's it's the blue that occurs in nature. It is 
it is the ocean it is the sky it is the sound of the ocean like it's it's not just that he's surrounded by blue it's that he's surrounded like by natural blue like Mm. he's at one with it yeah and you know they get home and kevin changes out of his uniform and he he changes into a blue shirt and then kevin looks at sharon with the kindest most open face (laughs) the script like you can read moonlight script literally just google it the descriptions in the script are just so beautiful for this final poetry poetry just gorgeous I don't like the way that a lot of white gays talk about the ending of this movie because I feel like it's not just white gays, it's just generally people that seem to have no media literacy for some reason and think that the film, because it doesn't end in this incredibly explicit way, that it can't be like an ending with Kevin and Chiron being together. And I don't actually understand how you saw, like the people who said this, like saw the same film that I did. But we talked about this a little bit in our Half of It episode, like the double standard that films about gay people of colour or LGBT people of colour, like are held to this insane standard compared to films about white people. Like, it's got to be a performance, you know? Like, people of colour in films have to perform being LGBT in a way that white people don't have to translate. You know, we talk about that all the time, but that's what I feel that it is. And and white people don't want to fathom that people of colour who are, like, LGBT have their own ways that they interact that are just as meaningful and they don't want to translate that like we we translate white media in our heads all the time to be relatable to us but they won't extend that same thing you know Mm -hmm. and i think the way that moonlight was talked about like some people didn't even want to call moonlight a a gay film because you know because it wasn't because it wasn't primarily about romance yeah yeah And I think, you know, I feel like because white people, they have this privilege of like, well, not all of them, that's a very blanket statement, but a lot of white LGBT people, not everyone, but a lot, you know, for them, it's much easier to connect with one another in communities. Like, again, this is a generalization and I realize not everyone can do that. But for LGBT people of color, there is layers of oppression and also just like general cultural things that makes it harder for LGBT people of color to connect with one another. And so the way that intimacy between us is expressed in film and also just generally in life is different as a result of that. And it just makes me frustrated. You know, the amount of times I've watched a film about white gay people and I've been like oh you know I I could never be like this because of xyz reasons but I'm still enjoying this and I can still see the value in this art you know but a lot of white people can't extend that same thing Mm. and it is multi-layered because obviously Moonlight is a black story about a black experience and there's probably also classism at play as well there Mm -hmm. but it very much frustrates me that you know Moonlight even like Moonlight has an Oscar you know Moonlight has an Oscar Moonlight has Oscar for best picture and it means fuck all yep actually before we get into this you just reminded me of something we don't really see Chiron have physical contact with other people throughout the film Mm -hmm. he tells Kevin in that final scene you're the only man that's ever touched me and I haven't touched anyone since there's actually this really lovely interview with um, Trevante Rhodes. Also, sorry, I've been I've been saying his name wrong this whole time. With there's this really lovely interview with Trevante Rhodes where he basically says, on a scale of one to ten, the love that Chiron feels from Kevin is a ten. So he he doesn't bother trying to find love elsewhere because he knows from the beginning that Kevin is his person. And yeah, so along the lines with what you're saying about not being able to express intimacy in the same way. Um, like when I've seen other people complain that they didn't kiss or anything at the end, like they just, they just sound so, they just sound so silly to me. Like I agree. Sh- Chiron is, for lack of better word, he's touch starved. Actually, no, that's exactly what he is. He is touch starved. And, you know, w- white gays love to go on and on about touch starvation and repression and how, uh, the Pride and Prejudice hand flexes gay <laughs> culture. But for them to see Chiron, 
laying his head on Kevin's shoulder to see Chiron being held by the man he loves in a way no one has ever held him, that is suddenly not gay enough for them. Like, what more like, do you need? it's not enough he for them to held. accept that he this is, is in even love. a romantic film, despite the fact that it, this is probably one of the most romantic films ever made. Like, why Why is it not enough for them? Like, you, I mean, you know why. We know why. I think it's just really funny how people watch a whole film about a black gay man and then be like, oh, this isn't gay. Like, <laughs> like this is a whole film. Now, where were we? Ah, yes, Moonlight has an Oscar and it means fuck all. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. And why is that? <laughs> What a mystery this is. <gasps> no one watched Moonlight. And no just, one okay. watched Okay, the everyone, why. everyone is aware by now of the debacle. People don't really know that Moonlight won Best Picture. They just know that La La Land lost Best Picture. Yes. Everyone is aware of the, of the gaff, as it has been known, as it has been referred to later on. It is memed almost every year. It is memed almost every year, and you know, like it, it was kind of funny. Like La La Land is one of those movies where, when I watched it, I didn't really have a huge problem with it. I quite liked it, but then throughout award season, like I began to hate it so much, just because of the way that people were talking about it and the way people were, yeah, just the way, just because white people were white people. No, I know, I know what you mean. I was embarrassed as a La La Land. I don't want to say fan because that implies a that La I La did. fan. I don't loser. want to say fan because that implies that I care about it like very deeply, which I don't, but I did enjoy it. And, you know, I just was like, why are all these people being so embarrassing? <laughs> yeah. So it, it was quite funny seeing like that victory taken out of people's mouths. Overall, just as a phenomenon, like that should not have happened. That is actually like one of the saddest things I think to ever happen because Moonlight's, Moonlight's win is significant. Being the first gay film to actually win. An Oscar. We talk a lot about what's Oscar bait. It was significant on so many levels. Yeah, and it was. It's just been not just of what it represented, but like who made it and how yeah. it was made and everything. You know, also you know, not for nothing, but like it was. It's like one of the very few Best Picture winners where I actually agree that that was the best picture of the year. Oh, hundred! Like it was the best picture of those nominated for sure. Yeah, but even then, it's it really was like the best film of the year. Like full stop. Anyway. Often the case is, you know, if we're lucky, often the case is that the best picture is the one out of what's been nominated. Mm. But often, like, it isn't even that. And often, like, that doesn't even mean that much. It's not uncommon for best picture winners to be forgettable, honestly. Like, it's not uncommon for best picture winners to kind of just have their moment for a little bit. And then, you know, for us to collectively forget about it in the public consciousness, I guess. But the thing about Moonlight is it didn't even really get that moment to bask in the glory. It was just taken from them. Barry Jenkins, he has a new series coming out called Underground Railroad, which I'm really excited about. I'm so excited for it. It'll probably be out by the time we release this episode, but whatever. The stills are just beautiful. Like, it I know. It just looks stunning. I, I know. I, James I, Laxton cinematography. We love it. We love to yeah, see it. Yeah, we love it. We love to see it. So Barry Jenkins has, of course, been doing the rounds, promoting it. And even four years later, he still has to defend Moonlight's win to people because after the gaffe, there was this narrative that was being spread that was very toxic, very racist, that Moonlight stole that Oscar from La La Land because it was, quote unquote, the black film. And that is that is. One, untrue. Two, horrendous. But it's also just crazy like for people to say that because it's like, how many black films actually win the Oscars? Mm, like, like- yeah, yeah, yeah. The narrative that Moonlight was Oscar bait as well was just... Was just Sounds a lot like anti-blackness to yeah. me. Yeah! Mm. Back to that moment of like not being able to bask in the glory. There was a recent interview with Barry Jenkins... I'll share it on the Gay V Club social. He actually said this moment of Moonlight winning Best Picture is going to be like the most visible thing in my career when people look me up 
And I didn't even get the same kind of angles, like camera angles that those guys got. Like I didn't actually, like it was not something that I could really enjoy in the moment. And it wasn't something that looking back at was what the achievement deserved. And he's right, of course, it really isn't. And uh, yeah, the narrative that Moonlight is Oscar bait is horrendous. And so I wanted to just spend this last part of the episode actually looking at the history of just LGBT films at the Oscars and to show you the kind of recognition that they actually have gotten. So we have spoken previously in our third and fourth episodes, we talked about LGBT biopics and in episode three specifically, biopics about gay and bi men that were very clearly Oscar bait and, you know, successfully baited. But yeah, anyways, go listen to that, to those episodes. We're very proud of them and we want to do like a video essay format of them later on. We do. So yeah, unfortunately there was this like very disgusting narrative being promoted around just like in the general, uh, for lack of a better word, like cinephile circles, like cinephile culture or whatever that Moonlight won Best Picture because it was about a black tick gay tick uh man in poverty tick who had some kind of exposure to drugs tick and there is something to be said about the way that the academy loves to tokenistically acknowledge films like this that meet one or two of these uh quote-unquote categories to show that oh we care about like you know marginalized voices we care about indie cinema like only when it shows like the suffering but I feel like, you know, there's an argument to be made that Moonlight is a very celebratory movie in that aspect. Like, it is, like, it is, it is. It's very rare that even even if these movies do, I don't know, fall into these categories, it's very rare that you actually have black men and, like, gay black men behind it, like, actually involved in writing these. Mm. But also, with that whole thing of, like, oh, you know, it has all these, like, ticker box things, which... It's not what it's about. But it's also like, let's say, for argument's sake, the Moonlight was made like a ticker box, which it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But let's say for argument that it was. How often does a film that ticked that many boxes actually get a look in? It doesn't. Usually the Academy won't mind if one or two of boxes are ticked. Like, Mm -hmm. loves a bit of poverty porn, but not about people of colour. And, ooh, okay, a film about people of colour, but it can't be about anyone gay. Like, mm -mm. Mm mm-mm. No, like it's very rare that like films that are intersectional get any kind of look, kind of look in. Usually, mm. like the ones that do, like the ones that are Oscar bait, are usually only ticking one of these boxes because the Academy, I don't know, they they're a bunch of old dudes. They don't have the brain span, like they don't have the bandwidth to be like, oh, what you can be all of these things. No, no mm. it sounds fake to me. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's too so- alien for them. Even the idea that Moonlight was done like a ticker box, like, wouldn't have worked in its favor, in theory, because, like, even you look at Nomadland, like, Mm -hmm. that's a very narrow perspective that film has, you know, Mm. and the way in for that movie, like, the point of view for that movie is a white woman, so it's, as far as intersectionality goes, like, Moonlight is the kind of film that very rarely even gets acknowledged at the Oscars, let alone Mm -hmm. does the feat of actually winning, Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that ticker box argument that we've heard like a million times it's 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 really just a false narrative that reeks of anti-blackness barry jenkins says this there's this very on point thing that he said where you know like if you look at moonlight's oscar race it totally makes sense like with you know all its previous wins and everything that it achieved on the way to the oscars because they were clearly running the same race but like moonlight is like an actual independently made film like the oscar campaign narrative of la la land was all about how hard it was to make that movie uh which is you know (laughs) of course it's so difficult to make Uh, a movie about two white people in la with dreams about making it in la in hollywood wow but yeah like barry jenkins said like we were running the same race as everyone else except we had to do it barefoot because we didn't have we didn't have all the extra support that all these other productions did which is yeah yeah that's true like uh a24 wasn't shit back then and moonlight made a name for a24 but also like A24 just didn't make any other films even close to Moonlight afterwards with the success. I don't even think they made Moonlight. They distributed Moonlight. No, they did. They did make it. They made it with Plan B. 
It's one of the few A24 movies that they actually made. Oh, okay. Back to the intended yes. segment of, you know, LGBT films. Moonlight is the first gay film to win Best Picture at the Oscars. Technically, though, it was Midnight Cowboy from 1969. However, Midnight Cowboy, lots of people have very mixed feelings about this because, you know, obviously its its success was significant, but also, you know, like any gay film made in 1969, it is exactly as homophobic as you would think it would be. Have or you worse. seen it? I've tried to watch it. It's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. The director is gay, so I don't, I don't really want to take away from that, especially like what they were able to, you know, there are obviously like limits of what they would have been able to do making a film like that at a time like that, but... Midnight Cowboy is technically the first uh, gay film to win Best Picture, but uh, we don't like to talk about that. Not a lot of people actually, <laughs> not a people lot of people like actually to care it. to mention that for good reason. Um, so yeah, Moonlight is the first gay film to win Best Picture at the Oscars, and technically, technically, although you know, loath as we are to admit, Green Book is the second. Anyway. Yeah, so of all LGBT films that have been nominated for Best Picture, there's only been 25 out of 571. So I did some math for this, guys. There's four, that's 4.37% of all nominees. So, you know, wow. to say that gay films are Oscar bait may be true, but they are never successful. I feel like you can't give, give them that level of shit to begin with. LGBT films, they do have better luck with screenplays. Uh, original and adapted yes. and there have been about 20 nominations in this century alone of lgbt films so yay they've also won some best international film winners uh, so a fantastic woman starring daniela vega won which i remember when that happened and i was so happy also all about my mother which i haven't seen and i know people have very mixed feelings about it's more actually that actors playing lgbt roles are nominated instead so over all four acting categories, there's been over 60 nominations given to actors playing LGBT roles, and half of those roles are then based on real people. Only eight of those 60 nominees are actually people of color, only six of whom are black. So to say that films about LGBT people of color are also Oscar bait or successful Oscar bait is again inaccurate. The first actor to be nominated for an LGBT role, even though this is subtextual, is Judy Anderson in 1940 as Mrs. Danvers in Rebecca. Um, then there are about like two more nominations in the 50s and 60s. And then from the 70s onwards, nearly every single year, there has been at least one nomination given to an actor for playing uh, gay, bi, or trans characters. Really? Every year? Nearly every year. And I think this is possibly due to Midnight Cowboy's success in 69. So yeah, the Academy is an institution of majority old white men who love to watch minorities struggle because it's the only way that they can find humanity in us. Though even then, they can't, they can't do that. And I also wanted to say that the only openly gay actors to win for playing gay roles are Ian McKellen, playing the iconic horror director James Whale in Gods and Monsters, and oh, also so bisexual ago. Angelina Jolie, who was playing Lisa Rowe in Girl Interrupted. The only openly trans actor to be nominated for an Oscar, despite all the amount of cis actors that have been nominated for trans roles, is Elliot Page, but even then, that was before they came out. Mm. And that's all, really. So yeah, I don't think that LGBT stories have actually been rewarded in any genuine kind of way. By the Academy, except for Moonlight. Do you think, because I think about this every year when Oscars, or rather just when award season in general comes along, do you think that it's possible even for the Oscars to actually award things when there's just so much stuff? Do you know what I mean? Like, there, there's just so much stuff. I often wonder, is it not worth, you know how like the BAFTAs have their own awards, right? And it's for British film, right? Mm -hmm. And even in Australia, we have the actors, right? And then there mm -hmm. are also organizations like BET. BT and, stuff. and, and, yeah, and yeah. like, is it not worth, like, can't there be like an LGBT? Um, yeah, there are, guess, though. But there's GLAD. The I GLAD. Guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. GLAD. For me, though, you know, as, as King Bong Jun Ho said, the Oscars are very local. So it's, it pains me that like we have to talk about the Oscars with this level of cultural impact because they do have this level of cultural impact though it is dropping uh admittedly like their viewership has was terrible this year um which I actually love to see um but also like because it is regarded in this way as like the best thing 
is like one of the highest honors, even though it really shouldn't be, is what makes it significant. And unfortunately, like, it's what's remembered. Like, you know, mm, we joke it is what's people- remembered. Like, literally, yeah. like the Academy gets to decide what is remembered. Mm. And they have such a narrow scope every year. Like every single year, it's always like the same five films. There's very little variation. And they're often, you know, American films. Nearly all of them are English language speaking films. And, you know, obviously they haven't widened their scope just on subject matter that much either. Even though it's great that the Academy has added more diverse members over the years. It's not enough. They're still outnumbered. It's like. not It's not enough. They're still outnumbered. And I feel like even if there was like a perfect reflection of society's demographics accurately existing within the Academy voter circle, like I feel like it still wouldn't be enough. And the fact is that like the Oscars simply should not have that level of importance. There should be like multiple institutions that we care about, which we do, but like they're not, they're not given that same kind of immortalization that Oscar winners are given. The Oscars are like the awards given at a, at a competition for like rotten tree orchards. Like, like by that I mean like the system itself, like where these movies are made, is so broken. That even mm. if you did have the Academy representing, like even if like tomorrow I could snap my fingers and make the Academy reflect the world, mm-hmm. it wouldn't matter because Hollywood as an industry is so built on old white money and mm-hmm. homophobia and every bad thing that is bad in a system that yeah. it would still mean that the movies that get that far that movies that can campaign i mean you said it before like barry jenkins said that he was running in a race with no shoes Mm -hmm. you know that would still be going on even if the academy's voters were like better people yeah and the origins of the oscars are not noble like the oscars were created because they wanted to stop yeah they wanted to stop actors from unionizing so they thought if they threw them a party every year and like you know went, oh, hey, don't unionize and we'll give you an award. Like, (laughs) and you know what? The the crazy thing is it worked. Yeah. (laughs) It actually worked. And they turned what was an anti-labor, an anti-union strategy into this Mm. big capitalistic event that also now has the power to decide on, like, film canon. Which yeah. is crazy. It's really crazy. Like, I think about that every year, like, when the Oscars come around. I'm like, a bunch of, like, old, crusty white dudes, like, mm-hmm. 70 years ago or whatever, didn't want actors to get paid for their work. Just all kinds of filmmakers, though. Sorry, Not yeah, just all actors, kinds yeah. of creatives, like, set dressers, like, all of them. They were like, oh, we don't want to pay them. What should we do? Oh, I know. We'll give them, like, little awards. Mm. And then they'll think that we actually give a shit about them. Mm -hmm. And then they created this big monstrosity that's, like, cannibalizing itself. Like, when you look into the history of the Oscars, it's just so, all of it's so broken. Mm. Like, just throw it out. Mm. Just throw it out. But at the Mm. same time, I don't want to throw it out because because I do think in a way, like, and I know it's kind of, I don't want to be like, oh, work within the system. But, like, for some filmmakers, like, it is still important for them to get that far, you know? Like, and I don't want to. And it does open a lot of doors. The post-Oscar win opportunities are, of course, disproportionate to people of color. Because, you know, like, we keep talking, like, over the last few years, like, you know, we it's fair to say that the the Oscars have made strides in, you know, celebrating diverse stories, which is wonderful. But also, like, the it's crazy the way that it lose, it's still losing its relevance in a way. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I love to see it lose its relevance because overall, like, it is just a very broken system, but it's also, like... The fact that these filmmakers that are finally getting that recognition just aren't being able to benefit off it as much as they used to be able to. You know, like Barry Jenkins, since Moonlight, that was four years ago, he only got to do Beale Street and an Underground Underground Railroad. Railroad. His next project, you know, because cinema is the state of cinema is fucking bleak. His next project is Lion King 2. What? Yeah. What? Live action Lion King 2. Are you ser- are you serious? I'm serious. I'm I'm actually like I'm sitting here with my mouth open. I had mm. no I did not know that. Mm. Mm. Like I actually and I honestly don't blame him cuz like he, Barry Jenkins is one of the few filmmakers that actually talks about how 
much it sucks, like how expensive it is to make films and how it has just gotten more and more expensive given the way that Hollywood is designed and the way that Disney has like killed so much. Disney and other, the huge production companies have killed so much in the way of indie cinema and like making it even possible like for those shoestring budget movies to even see the light of day. And yeah, I, I honestly don't blame him. Like post pandemic, like it's so bleak mm. for filmmakers that like the best you can do is is is, is work for Disney. <laughs> like that's the that's the big opportunity that you get that's the that's the that's what the doors open you to now. Disney jobs. Um it's so bleak. It's so bleak. I hate it here. I hate it here. <laughs> In conclusion, Barry Jenkins is like one of my favorite romance directors and just one of my favorite directors of all time. He just knows what's up. Terrell of McCraney is such a talented writer. And yeah, Moonlight is a good film. Moonlight's win at, at the Oscars is significant because I feel like it's one of the few good films. Yeah, it's it's one, it's just actually good and it's it's just so full of love and it's so personal. I love this movie. It's it's the best movie. I too. I love this movie. I don't know, I think usually because when I make my way through films that are suspected to be Oscar nominations, I generally don't expect to like them because I generally don't. Like mm-hmm. I'm always like, ah, uh, yes, I see why this was nominated because it's a Hollywood hand job or yada yada yada. Mm. But like Moonlight is one of those few films that I'm like, oh I I genuinely love this film. And yeah. I I genuinely think it's it's worthy of every praise that it is received and yeah. that everyone involved in it was involved in it for the sake of creating like this beautiful piece of art. They didn't make something to win an award. They didn't make something because they wanted to appear like f- for optics or anything. Like they they wanted to make a beautiful story. Mm. And there's just so much intention in Moonlight that I feel like we don't see that often in films like where you feel like there's so much intention in like every bit of it. Mhm. And I just I don't know, we're so lucky. We're yeah. so lucky that, that we got it. You know, we're so lucky that we have a film like Moonlight. Mm-hmm. And just a reminder to people, if you live in Australia, Moonlight's on Netflix at the moment, you know, so you yeah. can watch it. It's also on Canopy, I think, isn't it? Yeah. It's, yeah, so. Yeah. Or, so, you know, buy the Blu-ray. It's worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. You know, it it really is. Mm. And. And then, you know, I I listen to the Moonlight score all the time. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Also, and I know, like, you know, this is about Moonlight, but I also, a lot of people did not see If Beale Street Could Talk. Like, you should also watch If Beale Street Could Talk. You should also watch that, yeah. And also just, like, for film gays that are trying to get through, like, the gay film canon, I have noticed, like, people are kind of avoiding Moonlight for, I don't know, the fact that it's too serious or whatever. I don't care. Like, grow up. Like, <laughs> yeah, grow up. <laughs> grow also, up and watch this movie because it's so. I feel it's so I feel good. Like that's weird. Like people will say that about Moonlight, but then they'll also like. What does that mean? Do you think Portrait of a Lady on Fire is not serious, or like, wh- what's the what's the deal with that? Like, what's the difference? What's the what's difference? The difference? Uh, it's like when people go, oh. You know, I don't want to watch Pariah because, you know, it, 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 it looks too serious. Like, oh, really? You know, but you'll watch Lady Bird. Like, but then again, that's not serious. The whole film's a joke. For for white people that, like, have never watched an Xavier Dolan movie, like, Lady Bird is serious. <laughs> <laughs> it is, though. <laughs> uh, yeah. Honestly, you should watch Moonlight. Like, Moonlight, yeah. it probably will... Have ele- like it will be remembered in history for a lot of like reasons that it shouldn't. Mm. But I hope in like sixty years time, or well, f- first of all, it'd be cool if I'm still alive and we're still here. I hope that in that time I can be like, yeah, I remember when Moonlight won, and I'm gonna say that every time. I'm not gonna say I remember when La La Land lost because. Mm-hmm. Imagine if we did everything that that way. Like, imagine if, like, every year, instead of saying, oh, I remember when this movie won, we were like, oh, <laughs> you know, for example, with this year, it's like, instead of saying, oh, I remember when Nomadland won, you go, I remember when um, N- Minari and... <laughs> and I remember like, when just- the man who sold his skin lost. <laughs> okay? 
<laughs> when Shape of Water won. I remember when Paddington 2 lost. <laughs> I remember when... Um, when Mad Max lost. <laughs> when Mad... I remember when Mad... I remember... Mad Max you know what I Road. You, oh. No, the only the only other one that I can, that is close to that that is genuinely close to that is I remember when the social network lost. Yeah, I think we all remember that. We all remember that. That was a tough time oh. in okay. history. Anyway, um, yeah, reminder: go and watch Moonlight. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I wouldn't say it's any less or more serious than most coming of age yeah. stories. Like I, I really wouldn't say that. Hmm. I don't know, we've talked about coming-of-age stories before on this podcast, but, like, I do think, yeah, if I had watched this movie during my coming-of-age age, age, like, Mm. it would have helped me. Yeah, and I think the beautiful thing with Moonlight as well is that because it it follows someone through three different stages of their life, I I do think, like, in a weird way, there is something for everyone in Moonlight. Mm. Moonlight is beautiful, and I think people... I mean, I am judging people who don't who who deliberately don't watch it, but I also just feel like really sad for you if you avoid it. Yeah, because you're missing out on something really lovely. Anyway, guys, thank you. It's good to be back. Thank you for listening. We have a lot of stuff in store for you guys for mm. the rest of this volume. So stay tuned. Next episode, probably on it's a sin, or. Yeah. On high budget LGBT movies. Mm. Yeah, okay. Thank you for listening. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.